after Jim's talk, how many of you love change? Let me see a show of hands. Come on, we all love change because it's coming, right? So let me start off by asking, who remembers the days when you put your Walkman, you got so excited you were going to, if you able to take that Walkman with you and you put it on your, on your arm and you got out there and you started running. Let me see a show of hands of people who had a Walkman. Remember that? Yeah, we can take our music with us. Wasn't that revolutionary? That was in the 80s. Who doesn't? I'm looking around here. Is there anyone in here that doesn't remember the Walkman? Yeah, I don't think so. So good, we're all on the same page right now. Yeah, the Walkman. And then it was in 2001. I remember this because I, I love Steve Jobs. Jobs comes out, he's got a video, and he says, imagine. And he's holding up this little white thing. It looks like a deck of cards. Imagine a thousand tunes in your pocket. And I'm thinking, who the heck knows a thousand songs? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard of, right? I was wrong on that one. Yeah, I was wrong on that one. The iPod was born in 2001, and things started changing. We started to begin to listen to our music. We were carrying it with us. And then in 2007, he came out and he said, imagine, we've got our tunes, we've got our email, and now we've got the internet. The internet. How many of you in here have an iPhone or some sort of a smartphone? Yeah, let me see a show. Now I'm looking around. I think there's a couple of you that might still have the flip phone. I'm not going to ask. Right? I'm looking. I see you back there. Yeah, okay, remember. So people tell me, you know what, I can't change. But you can. You've got a smartphone. How many of you, guys, I don't know about you, but women, how many times a day do you think you've lost your phone? Right? We have a little mini. We have a little mini heart attack. <gasps> Where's my phone, right? Because we can't find it. And how far would you drive if you left your phone at home and you were going to work? How far would you drive? 20 miles back? 30? I've heard someone say, I would drive 40 miles back to get my phone, right? We can't live without our phones. Our phones have changed the way we live. I can't wait for my phone to become a scale. I have a big meal, I pop my phone down, I get on it, ooh, I gained a couple pounds, right? So things are happening, things are changing, and, and I like that. I like that, yeah. So the phone has begun to change the way we are, and the, we are always connected. How many of you have your internet right now? How many of you are tweeting? Is anyone in here tweeting? How many of you are taking notes on your phone? You see, we're always connected, and it's become a change. It's been in the last eight years that we depend on. And if we go to a hotel and we can't get the internet for free, what, we're mad. We're mad because we want to always be connected. So we start to realize that we are change agents. You can change. You have the ability to change. But many people tell me that they're sick of it. I'm sick of all these changes that are going on. And they say that they have what's called change fatigue. Change fatigue, I hear it all of the time. Do any of you suffer from a little change fatigue? You see, it's not new. It's not new. If you think back now, Downton Abbey is over, but if you start watching Downton Abbey and you saw them going through all of the changes at the turn of the century, I kind of giggled. Because they were the exact same changes, not exact with a phone, but back 200 years ago, people were complaining about young people. They were complaining about their work ethic. They were complaining about the technology that's coming and we're going to have to drive cars and we're going to have to use the phonograph. And that was 200 years ago. So you see, we're in always this time of perpetual change. We're in a place where change is just who we are. So my goal today in the few minutes that we have up here is to shift your mindset. You see, I want you to leave here excited. I want you to leave here thinking about the changes that are happening in your life, thinking about the changes that are happening in the credit unions. Because here's what I know about credit unions. I think you have the greatest story to tell. I get excited when I have to come and speak to credit unions because you are what the millennial is looking for. You have the story. You are about relationships. You are collaborative with other credit unions. And you form the relationship, which is what the millennial is looking for. And you call your members members because they are part of who you are. To me, you are positioned in the perfect place for growth. The perfect place, but you have to make changes. You have to begin to look around and you have to begin to get excited about technology, excited about the ideas that the young people are bringing in because this is the future. So my goal today is to get you excited and to help you shift your mindset. Because see many, I'm looking around and I see a lot of experience in this room. 
I see a lot of people that probably have said, even maybe yesterday, hey, if there's any changes going on, you come to me. I've been around 30, 40. I bet there's a few of you that have been here almost 50 years. Am I right? And you have that experience. And you know how things work. But no matter how much experience, no matter how much time you've been in credit unions, here's what I want you to realize, that we have to shift. Because you had and have a fixed mindset. I know how things work. I've been here. I have the experience. But we're moving. No matter what our age, we're moving from this fixed mindset to a growth mindset. And a growth mindset says, you know what? I've been around a while, but I may need to learn something new. I may need to be open. And so I want you to think about this growth. For me, I couldn't wait. I went to Ohio State University. I couldn't wait to get out. I still have dreams. I still have dreams. And I've been gone quite a while that I've missed the final. And I'm running in my dreams to that final. And I get there, and I haven't even bought the book. Have any of you ever had a dream like this? I'm still dreaming about nightmares from college, right? So I couldn't wait to get out, man. And I thought, once I was done, I was done. I read, I study, I watch TED Talks more now than I did in school because right now the world is full of new ideas and I want to be relevant. I want to be listened to. I want my grandkids to ask me questions. And the only way I'm going to do that is to have an open mindset, to have this growth mindset. So what if I said to you, You've got to make a change. Let's all think about one change that maybe you want to make in your life. Maybe you haven't made this change. For me, my son Ben is 30 years old. This is a true story. I gained a lot of weight with Ben. I'm still trying to get it off. <laughs> 30 years, right? Every, every New Year's I'm on a diet. I'm trying. Right? So I have this issue that I keep, it's, it's reoccurring. It keeps coming up. Lose a little weight. Lose a little weight. How about you? Is there, yeah, you're nodding out there. Yeah. Why haven't you made the change? So what if I told you that you have to make this change? You have to sign a, a note out there as you walk out the door that you're going to promise that you're going to make this change or you're going to die. Would you change or die? Come on, let me hear you. Would you change or die? Thank you. You would make the change, right? You'd think people would, but I'm going to tell you really quickly a story. And here's what the story is. When I first started speaking... This is one of my Bibles, Fast Company Magazine. And Fast Company, right as I started speaking, came out with this article called Change or Die. And it became the foundation of my change talks. They studied 100 men. Women, we were not in this one. It was all men. 100 men who had severe heart disease. It was so bad that breathing was tough. And they were all offered an opportunity to have the operation if they promised, if they signed a document that said they would change their diet, they would go on the Dean Ornish diet. They would do some meditation, a little yoga. And they would call a buddy once a week. They would have a conversation with a buddy and talk about how they're doing with their progress. And they would exercise. They all signed 100%. Of course, we'll do this. Change or die, man, I'm going to change, right? 100 men, first year out, how many stayed on the diet? How many stayed on the plan? All of them. Man, they were scared. Fear. Second year, we lost a third. Now, I don't know if we really lost them, but a third fell off. By the third year, only three stayed on the program. But they had the right intention. They all signed it. So what happens? We make a decision that we're going to change, but then I call it the drift. The drift comes in, and we go back, and we go back. So I decided that we need a formula. Because I don't want that drift to happen. I want you to make this change, to be a change agent, to be excited about change. So here's my formula. It's easy. Relate, repeat, reframe. Relate, repeat, reframe. It's easy. So let's start it off. Relate. Relate is the buy-in. Relate is the buy-in. So some of you have to go back and talk to your credit unions. You've got to get really good at selling it, right? Because, man, I just put a couple of the changes up there. The world is changing quickly. The world is changing quickly. I bought in. I want to be relevant. I want to be open to change. So I'm in. How many of you are in? Let me see. Are you in? Come on, guys. <laughs> all right. I'm going to just assume you're all raising your hand right now. Yeah. So the first question I've got to ask all of you energetic people this morning is, how do you see the world? 
Because you've got to begin to look at where you're coming from. How do you see the world? How do you see the world right now? Do you see the world as hard? Sick of these kids. All their ideas. I'm sick of this technology, man. It's hard. I want it to go back to the way it was. Because, see, if you see the world as hard, if you see the opportunities as tough, if you see young people as a challenge, then guess what comes to you every day? Hard, tough, and challenging. If you see the world, though, as an opportunity, because here's where I am right now. I believe we are standing in a time where there's the most opportunity. Yeah, I like the word disruption. Things are changing. Things are turning inside out. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of where we're going. So I see opportunity. I look at the faces here at this table, and I get excited because this is where we're going, and I want to know. I want to know what they're thinking because if you want the world to change for you, if you want opportunity to come to you, if you want change, you have to change. Change doesn't just happen. You have to change. So I want you to get curious about what you don't understand. I want you to get curious and excited. I a good friend of mine was telling me about Twitter in the beginning. I, I made fun of it. I said, yeah, you're going to tweet all day, tweet, tweet. I laughed at it. I rolled my eyes at it. But I have learned now. I have learned that when people are talking about things that I don't understand, instead of rolling my eyes, I look at them and I say, hmm, hey, man, that's interesting. Tell me more. So this is the interactive part of my 20 minutes. I want you to look at somebody at your table. I don't care who it is. Everybody look into your table. I want you to fold your arms. Let's do this. I'm watching you. Come on. Thank you. Come on. Fold your arms. You guys are a tough audience. Come on. It's the end. I want you to look at someone in that table, and I want you to go. I'll show you what I want you to do. I want you to go, hmm, nod your head. That's interesting. Tell me more. On the count of three, I'm listening. One, two, three. Nah. No. No, no. Louder. You got to be better. Come on. I know this is the end. I want to feel energy in here. I want to feel this room shake. The count of three, I want energy. Ready? One, two, three. Hmm. That's interesting. Tell me more. I want that to be your mantra. Hmm, that's interesting. Tell me more. I got to move on. So we relate. We're going to say, that's interesting. Tell me more. We're going to be open. Now we have to put behaviors in our lives. We have to put behaviors in our lives in order for the change to happen. So we have to create rituals. We have to create rituals. So there's my dog, Wally, right? There's Wally. Wally, every morning Wally wants to walk, right? But I don't want to walk with Wally. I know that I need to walk with Wally, but I don't want to walk with Wally. One night I slept in my walking clothes so that when I woke up I would be ready to walk with Wally, right? Didn't work until I got a headset. And I started listening to audible.com. And I started listening to books on tape. And all of a sudden I created a ritual. I looked at the dog. I put the headset on. I'm listening to a book on tape. I'm getting excited and I walk Wally. The first book that I was listening to, it was long. It was a tough book. But as the chapters got better, I noticed I was walking Wally longer and longer and longer. So we have to begin to put rituals into our lives that will make us want to do whatever the change is that we're looking at, right? So how do you wake up in the morning? Oh, good, I got to laugh. How do we wake up in the morning, right? Is that that's what I look like? What's the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning? Now, I'm looking at this audience, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But for many of us, the very first thing we do is what? Come on. We look at our phone. You do. I can tell. You look at your phone. For many of us, we wake up, we roll over, there's our phone. We look at our phone. We check our email. We check our email. And then all of a sudden, there's an email on there, and you were going to go meditate, you were going to go work out, but oh my gosh, there's an email, like, I got to take care of it right away, and what do you do? Well, first you go to the bathroom, and then you take your phone in there with you, right, because you don't want to waste any time, and then you go and you get to your office, and you start working, you guys over there, you know what I'm talking about. And the reality of it is, is that we've let somebody else start our day for us. We start our day with someone else's agenda, and it's a habit that many of us have. What I want us to do is to start our morning with a plan. Try not to look at your phone 
until you've made a plan, made some sort of a decision about how you're going to spend your day. Make it a ritual. For me, I have my little book next to my coffee maker. I make my coffee, I sit down with my cup of coffee, and I plan my day. What are the most important things I need to get done today? What are the commitments I've got to make? Who are the people I need to connect with? And who are some of those people that don't even expect me to call, but I'm going to call just to see how they're doing? Because I'm growing relationships. What are the projects that I need to be working on? And once you get that started, your day seems to go much better because we have a plan. The last part of it is reframe. Reframe could be the hardest part. Reframe is acting as if. Acting as if you already are a change agent. Acting as if you already are excited about change, right? So, I'd love to put this picture up here. How many of you miss Jay? In this room, I'm pretty, pretty sure a lot of you miss Jay. I'm looking around. How many of you love Jimmy? All right, we love Jimmy. Why do we love Jimmy? He's fun, he's interactive, he's great. But I was worried, how many of you knew Jimmy back in the days of SNL? I mean, I remember Jimmy. I was a little worried how he was going to show up. But that first night on The Tonight Show, he wore that cool suit. He lost a little weight. He showed up good. And he's been showing up great ever since. He never showed up scared. He never showed up worried. He came out there looking like he ruled, and he does. So when we walk out of this door, I want to see people excited about change. I want to see you curious. I want to see you asking people, tell me more. Hey, man, that's interesting. I want to hear more about it. I want to see you get an excitement for technology and be open to learning. And I want you to walk out with that because we can spot it. Because the biggest part of change, the part that we forget is that once we make those decisions, once we have those behaviors, we begin to act as if. So seek disagreement. Seek disagreement. For me, when I first started speaking, the first mentor I got was a man. It's the smartest thing I ever did. It was Garrison Wynn. He taught me things that I know as a woman, but he taught me different ways of communicating so that I understood men better, and man, it helped. And then in 2008, 2009, when my business kind of went out the window, I don't know if any of you remember those tough years, I partnered with a millennial. I partnered with Crystal Washington, and Crystal was a social media guru. I was a speaker. We combined our talents, and we created a project that really got me through 2009 because I had no idea that baby boomers needed to learn about social media. I helped the baby boomers. She did the technology. It was a great match. So as we're going through this road of change, as we're going on our journey, seek out people who think differently than you. Take the time and ask them their ideas. Because today, the generations, the generations see the world with a different perspective. I'm going to close it down with a quick story. I think I've got a second. I can't really tell what I've got here. So I'm going to end it with a story. When I first started speaking, I came from retail. I was a retailer in Houston for about 20 years. And when I started speaking, I thought I would be an overnight success. I thought my customers would look at me, they'd be excited, and then they would hire me to speak. But it didn't work that way. Actually, I scared them. Like they thought, what could you speak on? So I joined an association very similar to this. I joined the National Speakers Association, and I met phenomenal speakers, and I learned what great speakers were like. And I studied the greats. And I watched them, and I practiced, and I learned, and I hung out with people. And I joined my local association. In my local association, a young guy, really young, he'd come from stand-up comedy, was a huge success. He had already made it, and he was still in his 20s. One night, the kid came to hear me speak. I was speaking at the Westin Gallery in Houston, and he was sitting right where you are. I couldn't wait to finish my speech so he would tell me how great I was. When it was over, he came up, and <laughs> he said, hey, man, you were good, but I'd like to be your coach. My coach? I was looking at him, I think, and then all of a sudden, it hit me. He knows what I don't know. He knew comedy. And I said, sure, you can be my coach. And he said, my wife and I will have you over for dinner Sunday night. Come on over. So I was so excited. I went to Staples, and I bought a notebook and put hundreds of pieces of paper in. I wrote speaker coaching in the front. I was going to have the kid teach me everything he knew. When I got there, he looked at the notebook, and he kind of laughed. He threw it on the couch. He goes, we're not going to learn that way. You see, he was going to teach me a different way than I knew. Pretty much he just told me his jokes. 
And the more I laugh, this is a dating tip for any of you out there, the more I laugh, the more he invited me back. <laughs> so you can laugh at guys' jokes, it works. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It worked. I was learning a lot about comedy. We were becoming friends. He must have thought we were really good friends because one night I was speaking in Austin, Texas. It was about midnight and I got a phone call from him. He woke me up from a sound sleep. Karen, I'm at an airport in Vegas. They love me. I rocked. I rocked. I rocked like a rock and rock star. Oh man, my flight's here. I gotta go. And they, he hung up. The kid called to tell me he rocked. How arrogant. I couldn't go back to sleep. I was so mad. A week later, another call. I rocked. I rocked. I asked his wife, does he call you? She said, I don't take his call. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting into it. When I see it's him, I go, hey, man, did you rock? Yes, I rocked. I rocked. It's good. One day I wake up, and I'm not happy. I'm not calling anybody. I'm not rocking. If you're not rocking, I want you to look at yourself. I want you to say, what changes do I need to make? Because we're responsible for the changes and the happiness in our lives. So I made some changes. I bought a Mac. I started adding music to my programs. I started really thinking more about your needs because it's not the Karen show. It's not always about me. It worked. I was up in Minneapolis, Minnesota. I was speaking to a group of hardware people. They are hard, but they love me. When it was over, they were hooting and hollering. They were waving their napkins. I couldn't wait to get to the airport to call my friend to tell him how great I did. When I got there, you're not going to believe this. His number was not in my phone. But my sister Patty is, she's a little bit older than me. She's a tr I'm gonna call her. Patty, I'm at an airport in Minneapolis. They love me, I rocked, I rocked. I rocked like a rock and rock star. And my sister goes, ooh, what's wrong with you? Have you been at the bar? <laughs> and she hung up on me. You see, my sister got scared. She thought I got all the rock and there was no rock left for her. If you're sitting next to someone who is succeeding right now and you're worried that that success isn't going to come to you, don't be afraid. Because here's what I know. Hang with people who rock. Tell people when they rock. Notice people when they rock. Because don't worry, there is enough rock for all of us. Thank you, guys. I'm Karen McCullough. See you later. Thank you.